So we're back and we've got improved accommodation. In the last video I introduced the idea that brains don't exist, which is a kind of an odd claim, but then we started this series with the idea that there's only one number and that's one. From the point of view of an embodied being, reality is continuous. To single out brain as a distinguished object means to idealize and to abstract away from the reality of a nervous system integrated into a body. The nervous system and muscles form complementary pairs in a body and cannot be understood without each other. Now we do this all the time. We are very, very good at idealizing and at abstracting. In the context of these videos, we're speaking specifically though about the idealizations of physics, which has its idealizations, and the idealization that we might choose to adopt if we were, for example, a creature with a body, with a single body, as if we could understand ourselves paradoxically as one without another. Now, contemporary cognitive science is a wild territory, and I'm assuming that there's interests on the part of someone for some of these concerns, but I'm, I'm actually not alone, despite the bizarreness of the claims that are being made here. This book has just come out. It's by Evan Thompson, Adam Frank, and Marcelo Gleiser. That's two physicists and an embodied cognitive scientist. It's called a blind spot, and its principal concern is to show, is to clear the decks of all the complications of the differentiated disciplines of science, and to focus specifically on that science which has a claim to have a particular and compelling view of reality, which is theoretical physics, and the um, impossibility of including within that physical picture lived experience or consciousness or cognition. You see, we're not very good at these words. And our language is in need of improvement here. If we're ever going to make progress, um, and so who doesn't like a bit of progress, our language needs some help. I want to venture into uncharted waters here. I said that we can recognize that to describe, to speak of the brain at all, is to speak of an imaginary object because there is no border between the brain and the rest of the nervous system. The nervous system is a whole and is integrated into a body. I spoke before of the photosensitivity of the pineal gland and I mentioned that there were two other photo, photosensitive parts of the brain. I said the retina, and most people wouldn't traditionally understand the retina to be part of the brain, but it absolutely is. There's no discontinuity between retina and brain. Um, so when we speak of our sensitivities, we're speaking of the sensitivities that a body can display a body in which those sensitivities are mediated through the nervous system and the movement of the body um, results. Um, I'm sensitive to many things. If the root temperature of the room drops, I'll start to shiver and it'll be a whole body kind of thing. One thing we're particularly sensitive to is light. And here this debate with the physicists becomes very profound and mysterious because physics has chosen to work up the concept of light in its own particular way. It's not a given that light needs to be treated as physics does. When I say the word light, you're probably thinking of the colors of the rainbow, Isaac Newton, Pink Floyd, that kind of thing. Um, within the physical vocabulary, we're just talking about electromagnetic radiation. But the associations that spring to mind to us come precisely from our sensitivities, from the photosensitivity of the brain, which has evolved on planet Earth in a, an environment shaped largely by our big, big, the sun and the sky, that yoke, the source of nearly everything on Earth. So bodies have sensitivities, and these that's the point of a nervous system is to, to introduce this fluidity and sensitivity into a body. But in discussing human cognition, our vocabulary is terribly, terribly mixed up, and we have a, an unfortunate view of, uh, of ourselves and our sensory epistemology. 
And a, a sensory epistemology means coming to know what you know through your senses. Now, what the hell are senses? Nothing in what we've said so far has given us a way of talking about our senses. In deep cultural memory, there's a standard way of talking about senses. There are five senses, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling. Those five have occurred in other cultural contexts as well. They developed in India as well. Um, some have chosen to put a sixth sense in, into that menagerie. The Buddhists consider certain kinds of mental formations as belonging in there as well. And that's a very interesting view and alerts us to the fact that, hang on, our sense, the five classical senses are a com comfortable way for us to think and talk about how we get by in the world, what we, how we perceive the world, interact with the world. But mapping from those five senses to the body has never worked. You can't find inputs and outputs. There's no distinction between five separate sensory modalities. In short, the sensory epistemology we're working with is entirely fictional. Any idea that things go into the brain is thoroughly mistaken. Now, there's way too much history here to be overcome in one short series of videos. This is, what I'm doing here is utterly futile. But the more we set the concerns of embodied beings um, and separate them from the picture of reality delivered by physics, specifically, the more we realize that our discussion of ourselves, our knowing, our being, our perception, our faculties, our consciousness, is uh, based on very, very uncertain foundations. Um, recognition of this makes most contemporary discussion of perception um, incomprehensible. Um, but we're talking about a very, very deep problem, and I think the title of this book is well chosen, calling it The Blind Spot, um, emphasizes that in the development of a scientific worldview, something got left out at a very early stage, um, and we're reaching the limits of a scientific worldview. We've passed them already. We, we know we need to think bigger, differently, understand our relation to others and the earth differently. We know all this, but we don't know how to proceed. So, thinking about embodied living without relying on brain-centric fantasies is an interesting exercise. And maybe we'll squeeze a few more videos out of that. What do you think? Hmm.